everyone, Ben Starr here. Since my first episode on MasterChef aired, I have been literally inundated with people asking me to teach you how to brew beer. So that's what I'm gonna do today. Now it actually takes two to three weeks to brew five gallons of beer. So we're not gonna get it all finished today, but we're gonna get it started and I'm gonna show you how. Now, traditionally or historically, beer has only four ingredients. Water, hops, yeast, and malted grain, uh, traditionally that means barley, uh, but uh, historically wheat has also been used uh, to make beer as well. So let me just kind of give you a quick overview of these four ingredients and how they play together to produce beer. If you're really interested from a scientific perspective, there are plenty of resources on the web for you to read as much information as you'd like. But what we're going to do is start with beer. I have in this bowl about two and a half pounds of various types of malted and roasted barley. Now, the malting process involves soaking regular barley grain in water so that it germinates or starts to sprout, like to grow into a plant. Uh, but then shortly after that process begins, inside the grain, all of the sugars that were locked up tight are converted to simple sugars in order to be able to feed that newly growing plant. And when those sugars are just at the right moment for brewing beer, the malting process is stopped by roasting the barley and that kills the young sprout and it freezes that grain in, or freezes those sugars inside the grain in the perfect way for us to be allowed to extract them and turn them into fermentable sugars, which is where the alcohol in beer comes from, okay? So we've got malted barley here. Malted wheat is also used and it gives a nice tangy uh, taste to some uh, specific types of beer that use wheat. Now, this is not nearly enough grain to make five gallons of beer. We'd need anywhere from 15 to 20 pounds of grain, depending on the recipe. And most home brewers like myself just aren't set up to deal with the type of vat that, require, that, that can hold 20 pounds of grain and five to 10 gallons of water. So we have a shortcut that we take called extract brewing. And your local brew shop will carry both dry and liquid malt extract. This kind of looks and smells like molasses. And really all it is is malted barley that's had its sugars boiled out into water and then that water has been condensed so that we have this sticky substance left. So all this really is, is a shortcut from grain to the beer making process. All right, so actually I have eight pounds of pale malt extract and I've got two pounds of specialty grains here. Now, yeast. Yeast is the thing that transforms this sugary water into alcoholic beer. Yeast feeds on sugars and converts them into alcohol and carbon dioxide, the two byproducts of yeast's life cycle. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of different strains of yeast, and each one will produce a different flavor of beer. If you use the exact same ingredient in 10 different beers, and you use 10 different types of yeast, you'll have 10 different beers. That's one of the really exciting things about brewing is that there are, you're just only limited by your imagination as to the type of flavors that you can produce in your beer. Today I'm using an American ale yeast uh, produced by the company Y Yeast. Uh, they're one of the top selling companies for yeast for home brewers. Next, hops. I'm using a pelletized form of hops, but they also sell whole flower hops. Now the hops, are the flower or the cone of an evergreen shrub. And hops were originally added to beer to provide an antiseptic quality. Beer is sugary and it's easy for wild yeast and wild bacteria to get into that beer and turn it really nasty and funky. But hops have a wonderful antiseptic property that keeps the foreign bacteria out of the beer. Now again, there are dozens and dozens of different types of hops and each hop has its own unique characteristics. Hops are added to beer for three different reasons. The first is bittering, to add bitterness to beer, which is one of beer's famous characteristics. The second is to add flavor, and the third is to add aroma. We'll talk more about how those play out in the process of making beer later on when we get to that step. And the final ingredient in beer is, of course, water. And a lot of home brewers just use their tap water, but tap water contains chemicals and chlorine and things like that that I don't really want in my beer. I don't want the flavor in my beer, and I don't really want to be drinking it. So I buy just generic spring water at the grocery store. And the type of water you use, again, is going to change the entire flavor profile of your beer. The nutrients and minerals that are found in spring water actually are really good for our yeast. So that's why I like to use spring water. Do not, under any circumstances, use distilled water. That's pure H2O with nothing else in it, and yeast hate pure water. They need minerals 
in order to live healthily and produce all sorts of wonderful flavors to add to our beer. Okay, so the first step in our beer and brewing process is going to be to extract fermentable sugars from our malted barley. And today I'm brewing in my garage. It's a hot summer day and I really don't want to heat up the house. And we're going to be boiling water basically for two hours, so that's not something I want to do inside. But you can do it on your stove if you don't uh, have a little propane burner like this. But what you are going to need is a big pot. It doesn't have to be exactly this big, but your pot has to be able to hold at least about two gallons of liquid and a couple of pounds of grain. So we're going to take our pot. This is a tamale steamer. You can get them for 20 bucks at a Mexican grocery store. And we're going to add our water. Now what we're going to do is bring our water up to a temperature of between 150 and 170 degrees. And this is the ideal temperature range for extracting fermentable sugars from our grain. That just means we're pulling the sugar out of the grain and into the water so we can add some yeast. They will eat that sugar and turn it into alcohol. Now, so we're not boiling yet. As soon as our water gets up to about 160 degrees, we'll add our grain. Alright, so my water is just a little over 170. 160 is what we're shooting for, but it's going to cool down when I put in my grain. So, I'm going to go ahead and add my grain now. This is a really nice tool to have. It's called a grain bag. Uh, they are just a couple bucks at your local brew store. It's basically just like a strainer or a giant tea bag. And uh, I have actually switched to a smaller uh, kettle, which you probably picked up on. Uh, that's going to be, I'm using a smaller grain bag today because we're not using as much grain. All right. Now in go our malted and crushed grains. Now it's really just a matter of holding these grains right at 160 degrees, or between 150 and 170, for one hour. And that's going to extract all the fermentable sugars. It's the ideal temperature to do that. You don't want to take it over 170 degrees, because then you're going to start pulling out all sorts of tannins and stuff, and your beer is going to have a weird bitterness, not a good bitterness. So keep it in that 150 to 170 degree range for one hour. All right, so it's been an hour, and I am removing our grain that's been steeping in the water. Technically, this is called a miniature mash, uh, but I don't want to get too technical on you because this is your first time learning how to brew beer, right? Right. So we remove this, and whatever juices continue to come out of it will return back to the pot in just a bit. Now what we've got in our pot right now is called wort. It's spelled wort, W-O-R-T, but it's pronounced wort. And our liquid malt extract here is basically just wort that's been boiled down until it's thick and sticky. So we're going to go ahead and add the rest of our liquid malt extract. And again, this is almost the exact same thing as having taken 15 or 20 pounds of grain and boiled it for an hour. Gonna get all that in there, and that is going to add the total amount of sugar that we need to make beer. Okay, now stir that around really good to get it dissolved. And from this point on, the wort can burn and it can boil over. So you're really going to have to be stuck to the pot for the next hour, watching it, stirring it, adjusting the heat to make sure it doesn't boil over. But our goal at this moment is to bring it to a boil so we can begin adding our hops. So when your work comes to a boil, it is time for the one hour hop boil. Uh, virtually all beers are boiled for one hour with additions of hops at different points throughout that hour. And the time at which you add the hops to the wort during the boil determines the flavor bitterness profile of the beer. So we are going to start off by adding one and a half ounces of Chinook, which is a type of hop. And the hops that you add at the beginning of the boil are called bittering hops. And their sole purpose is to add bitterness to the beer. Later on, we'll be adding other types of hops at different stages that add flavor components and aroma components. And we're also adding a half an ounce of Amarillo hops. Those are our bittering hops. We're, I'm also adding half a cup of candied ginger. The beer that I'm making today is actually an India Pale Ale or an IPA, and I'm adding several non-traditional flavor components. One of them is ginger and one of them is grapefruit. So at this point, we're adding a half a cup of homemade candied ginger. 
Now, we don't have to add anything else for 45 minutes, but we need to keep an eye on the wort while it boils to make sure it doesn't boil over and spill out like it did earlier. So it's been 45 minutes, now it's time to add our flavoring hops. The bittering hops were added at the beginning of the boil, but by the end of the hour-long boil, any flavor that they had has been completely boiled away. The only thing they've contributed is bitterness. So right now, we're 15 minutes from the end of the boil, and I'm adding an ounce of Cascade hops. These don't add very much bitterness, but they add a lot of delicious flavor to the beer. So, 15 minutes gone, rather 15 minutes left to go, We'll be back in 10 minutes to add the last batch of hops. So we've got five minutes left in our boil. Now is the time when we add our hops that add aroma to the beer. And that's pretty much the only aspect you see of that is when you smell the beer and then the flavor that's kind of left in your nose after you eat the beer. So we're going to add one more ounce of Cascade hops to add aroma. And we've got five minutes left to go before our boil is finished. So we're about 30 seconds away from the end of our one hour hop boil, and I have one more addition of hops. These are Amarillo hops, and I actually used them at the beginning to add bitterness, but I'm going to use them at the very end of the boil, which is called flame out. And if you add hops at the very, very end of the boil, all of their essential oils get preserved. They don't boil away, and they give you a lot of aroma at the end. And Amarillo hops are known for having a very grapefruit-like aroma and flavor. And so we're adding them because today we're making a grapefruit ginger IPA. So it's time for flame out. Turning the boil off, adding the hops. And now our goal is to cool this work down as quickly as possible so we can get it to the optimum temperature for adding the yeast. Okay, so from this point on, we have to be really careful with our work because it is basically just sugar water. So it is susceptible to being inoculated by all sorts of wild yeasts floating around in the air, bacteria, anything. So we need to quickly cool it to the point which we can add our yeast, and then add the yeast, and then seal it off so that no bacteria can get to it. The best way to do that, in my opinion, is with ice. I have taken my sterilized spring water, and I have frozen it into big blocks of ice like this. So we're going to add this to our container, which has also been sterilized. And you can sterilize with bleach, if you really want to, it's not the best sterilizing agent to use for brewing, but it's cheap and you have it around. The best sterilizer is to use a thing called Bartender's Friend, which is an iodine-based disinfectant that you don't have to rinse off. If you use bleach to sterilize, you have got to rinse afterwards, and rinsing can actually bring in more bacteria. But, so I'm going to add this big chunk of ice to my bucket. And I'm going to pour my really hot wort right over it. And that is going to help cool it down very quickly. And at this point, I'm also going to add some refrigerated spring water because we are making a total of five gallons of beer. We started with about three gallons in our wort, but almost one full gallon of it boiled away. I've got a gallon of ice, so I'm going to add a couple of gallons of spring water as well, and that will also help cool our work down very quickly. <laughs> Again, hygiene is incredibly important from this part of the brewing process on. Anything that touches the work has to be sterilized, all right? So I'm going to stir it around to try to get that ice melted and get our wort chilled down. The temperature range we're looking for to pitch our yeast is in the 90 degree range. Any more than that, and you're just gonna kill the yeast off with heat. Any less than that, and it's too cold for the yeast to really start blossoming and eating up all that sugar. Okay, so my wort is about down to 85 degrees. That's still totally fine for my yeast. So the next thing I need to do is oxygenate it. Now at this point in beer's life cycle, it needs oxygen. In the future, once beer has been fermented, oxygen is its enemy. But at this point, oxygen is its friend because yeast needs oxygen in order to live and thrive. So we are going to oxygenate this beer by pouring it back and forth between two barrels. Vigorously.
the more it foams, the better. That means the oxygen is really going into it. Now this is a five gallon bucket and we're aiming for five gallons of beer. So you want to start off with just a little bit more than five gallons of work because we are going to lose some of that to carbon dioxide as the yeast dissolves the sugars inside the wort and converts it to alcohol and carbon dioxide. So we're going to add just a little bit more water and then we're going to pitch the yeast. Now, our yeast packet is fully distinted. The yeast in there is really active. We're going to dip it in our disinfecting solution here just to make sure it's clean. We're going to open it up. Pour it right into the beer. Now the next step is geek stuff, but it's really good in order to understand what's going on inside your beer and to be able to help you solve problems if problems arise. You need to get a little thing called a hydrometer. This costs like eight bucks at your local brew supply store. This measures the amount of dissolved sugars inside the wort and it will tell you how much alcohol your beer has developed at various points during the fermentation. So I'm going to put my hydrometer here into this little test vial. I'm going to take this sterilized measuring cup and I'm going to pull out some work. I'm going to try to get below all that foam because that foam kind of gets in the way. And we're going to add the work to the vial. Okay, so we're floating right at 1.060 on the hydrometer. So I'm going to make a note of that. And later when my beer is finished fermenting, that will allow me to know exactly how much alcohol is in my beer. Now it's time to close up our primary fermenter. So I'm going to take this plastic wrap off that's been protecting my lid. Press that down real good all the way around. Then we're going to take an airlock. It's been in our sterilizing solution. An airlock costs about $1.50 at your local brew supply store and you also need a cork. You press the airlock into the cork. You press the cork into the hole on your jug for your primary fermenter. Now you're going to fill this airlock with some type of liquid that bacteria cannot grow inside. I use vodka or whiskey or something like that. You can also use sterilizing solution, but liquor is the best thing to use. So now you set your safe airlocked wort in a coolish, warmish, dry place, preferably away from direct sunlight, for the primary fermentation process. And during this time, the yeast are going to multiply like crazy. They're going to digest all of that sugar that's inside the wort. They're going to turn it into alcohol. It's going to give off carbon dioxide and then it's going to bubble through the airlock. So within anywhere from 4 to 24 hours, you should start seeing bubbles coming through the airlock. And that is a sign that your yeast is super happy and eating all those sugars in the wort. Now, the temperature at which you do the primary fermentation makes a big difference as to the flavor in the final beer. If you take the exact same ingredients, the exact same yeast, and ferment it at 70 degrees, 74 degrees, 86 degrees, and 80 degrees, you're going to have entirely different flavors inside your beer. That's another exciting thing about homebrew is that your batches of beer are going to turn out different based on the temperature at which they ferment. Ales, which are the only thing that I brew, typically like to ferment at room temperatures, anywhere between 60 degrees and 80 degrees. Lagers, like your Coors Light, Bud Light, and things like that, 
need to be fermented at much lower temperatures in the 40 degree range. Most home brewers don't have a setup to allow fermentation to be kept within those temperatures. So you normally find that ales are the most popular beers brewed by home brewers. But ales are the best thing to drink anyway, so I don't know why anybody would want to drink a lager in the first place. But, so now we're going to wait and see what happens tomorrow about this time and find out if our yeast has taken hold in our wort. And eight hours later, we've got good bubbles coming through the airlock. That's a sign that our yeast is happy and healthy and busy converting all that sugar into alcohol.